Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. And thank you very much for being with us today. And welcome to the new event of the ISO Ipatia Colloquium. Uh, today, uh, we will have two speakers again, and uh, we have congratulations. You know, every time I'd like to, I, I'd like to congratulate with um, with our speakers uh, because you know they were selected through a very very uh, challenging selection process. So, congratulations for being with us, and looking forward for your talks. Just to uh, today, the two. Uh, moderators and the chairs of the event will be uh, Nicola and Samuel. They are fellow again, a fellow and student of ESO. Thank you very much to them also for volunteering and for chairing the session for us. Uh, very briefly, the technical uh, points uh, for the people on the YouTube chat on the on YouTube channel, they can send their questions via uh, the YouTube live chat, and the question will be then forwarded to the speakers via the chairs, or you can also, still from, from, from the web, you can also send your questions. If you don't comfortable with sending a question on the YouTube tab, you can still send a question via uh, the dedicated uh, questionnaire form that you can find on our pages, on the IPATIA pages on the ISO uh, portal. Then uh, for people that are in the, in the Zoom uh, uh, chat, they can raise the question, raise a hand, and the question uh, can be made by them directly to the speakers uh, once the, the chair gives you the word. Um, having said that, also please be, be considered for the people that are on, on YouTube, consider that there is a 30 seconds delay, more than 20 to 30 seconds delay between the time the the event is, is happening on Zoom and the time the event is broadcasting on YouTube. So the, don't be surprised if we make the question, but in the fact the event is already finished or the, 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 the speaker has already changed or, or something like that, don't worry. Anyhow, please send your question, put your question on, on the chat because it is uh, very important for the speakers. They have the, child, they have the, the chance basically even in the second later basically to reply to your questions and to address them. And also, please go to our pages where is the program of the event. You, there you can click on the title of the, or you can see the program, but you can also see the, our speakers and you can click on the title of the talk and then you are able to access the, the CV of the speakers and the information about the, the career. So this is also another way to get in touch with our speakers. With that, I will pass now the word to Nicola for the introduction of the event and thank you very much, enjoy. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for being here. I'd just like to introduce the first speaker of today. Our first speaker will be Pujan Agarwal. Uh, Pujan is a PhD student in her last year at, the, at Swinburne University of Technology, uh, where, among other things, uh, she works on massive stars, uh, massive stars evolution, and stellar and binary dynamics. And today, Pujan is going to uh, in her talk, answer for us the question, can uncertainties in the evolution of massive stars explain properties of gravitational waves progenitor? Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'm gonna leave the word to Pooja. Uh, Pujan, you may be muted. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And I'm just, just checking um, if you can see my screen. All good on this side. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and also for this opportunity to present my work. So this work and this talk that I'll be um, talking all about today is the part of the work I have done for my PhD. And today, yes, I'll be answering the questions about the uncertainties in the evolution of massive stars and how can we use them to explain properties of gravitational wave progenitors. This work I have done in collaboration with my supervisors, so with Professor Jared Harley, Simon Stevenson, Dorothea Sechi, and Chris Flynn. So let's get started. All right, let's start with massive stars. So for all intents and purposes of this talk, 
every time I say massive stars, I mean stars which are more massive than nine solar masses. Now, why bother about these stars? Well, they are responsible for a number of astrophysical processes. They do a lot many things. For example, they are responsible for the different transient phenomena such as supernovae and GRBs. They are responsible for the chemical enrichment of uh, their surroundings of the galaxies and star clusters. But most importantly, when they die, they form compact remnants, which are neutron stars and black holes. And among other things, these new, uh, black holes and neutron stars are progenitors of gravitational waves that we currently detect from LIGO and Virgo. So massive stars are important and we should uh, try to know more and more about them. However, there are many uncertainties in their evolution. We do not completely understand how these stars uh, live their life, how much mass they can lose through stellar winds, uh, what are the different nuclear reaction networks that operate inside them and at what rates, how rotation affects their evolution and how different mixing processes operate within these stars. Now, um, and this is just an incomplete list. There are many other uncertainties. The one I am going to talk about today is a little bit related to the mixing processes, but it influences all other uncertainties and their measurements as well. So let's get started with little something closer to home. What of boiling water? We've all seen this at our homes several times and um, we have never wondered that what this is doing is just boiling water, right? But this little process of boiling water here is demonstrating an important physical process. It's demonstrating the process of convection. Let's paint a simple picture of convention. So we have a, a blob, so in this, somewhere over this lower part, we have this little blob of particle and in this medium, both have density low. Now this blob, uh, it uh, gets uh, some heat. So it, um, its temperature goes up and because of buoyancy, it can, um, it rises up um, to uh, traverse a mixing length, let's say L. And now pressure equilibrizes with its surrounding. When it does that, its density changes. And now let's say it is at a density rho prime and the density of a surrounding is rho surrounding two. Now, based on this simple picture, we can define a criteria for stability. If the density of this uh, inside this uh, particle is greater than the density of the medium, then this particle will fall back and we will get convection currents. We call this stable convection. However, if the density of this particle is less than the density of medium, then it will continue to rise um, and travel upwards. And we call this as unstable convection. Either way, this part, hot particle, which is rising, is also displacing the cold matter. So the cold part, um, matter is coming down and we are getting transport of energy. Now this simple picture of convection can also be applied to stars. In fact, um, convection in uh, stars has much more important role. It's not just a mode of transport of energy, it also transports different elements and also angular momentum. In, um, when we try to model stars through 1D stellar evolution codes, convective transport of energy is treated using mixing length theory. It's the same picture I described about, uh, in the previous slide. Now, in this theory, if you have to apply this theory to stars, it assumes that convection depends only on the local condition of the stars, and it's, which means it's time independent. Now, with this simple approximation, we can define most properties of star and it works very well. But let's not forget that convection itself is a very turbulent and dynamic process. It's much more complex in reality than uh, what is assumed by the mixing length theory. And that's why sometimes mixing length theory fails and we get um, some unstable condition in our stellar evolution codes. So let's talk about that. So one such condition arises in the envelopes of massive stars when they reach Eddington luminosity. Now let's decompose this a little bit. Eddington luminosity is nothing but a critical limit of balance between, uh, define, uh, balance between the gravitational and the radiation uh, pressure. It, as you can see, is given by this uh, formula, Pho pi C GMR by K kappa R. The kappa here stands for opacity, so we can very easily conclude that um, Eddington luminosity is inversely proportional to opacity. 
and any increase in opacity can will reduce uh, this particular value. So now what happens that during the evolution of stars, we can get changes in opacity as different elements recombine or ionize. And remember this point, we are going to use it later. But coming back to our massive stars, our massive stars, as they evolve, they can uh, become really big and inflated and can develop these tenuous envelopes. In these tenuous envelopes, we can also get convective regions. Now, um, convection, as I said earlier, is very efficient at transporting energy. However, not always. In these um, really tenuous envelopes of massive stars, um, the particle density is not well enough. So the density is low and there are like not enough particles to transport uh, energy through convection. And here, convection, although it's present, is inefficient. And most of the hard work has uh, in transporting the energy has to be done by radiation itself. Now, under normal condition, <clears throat> uh, the amount of the, the luminosity transported through radiation, uh, which is uh, radiative luminosity, is less than Eddington luminosity. And the density gradient uh, in the star is always less than zero, which means your density always decreases with radius. However, as the star evolves, and again, um, as we seen earlier, that changes in opacity can reduce the value of Eddington luminosity. This can cause your radiative luminosity to be greater than the Eddington luminosity. Under such condition, to maintain hydrostatic equilibrium, your density gradient becomes greater than zero, which means it increases outwards from here on. Now this thing, we call it as a density inversion and it gives rise to convective instability and even other instabilities. Now, solving density inversions in massive stars is a huge challenge for 1D stellar evolution codes, especially with mixing length theory. And currently there is no uh, exact treatment uh, to solve this. So stellar evolution codes have to adopt different pragmatic methods to push the evolution of stars beyond these density inversion points. So, and there are different ones. So for example, you can artificially enhance mass loss rates. So you just get rid of this outer convection layer and can remove density inversion uh, regions. That's one way. You can enhance uh, the efficiency of mixing. So you can make your mixing more efficient. So uh, through efficient convection, the star is able to overcome uh, density inversions. You don't allow density inversions to happen, or if they happen, you suppress them. So that's like the third way. And, or, or you can just let your star evolve without any enhancements. And when your model fails, you compute your, the stellar properties through cross-processing. So these are like some of the different ways that stellar evolution codes use to overcome these density inversion problems. Now by themselves, these methods are not a problem, but when combined with other uncertainties in the evolution of massive stars, they can result in different sets of stellar models. To study how different these uh, stellar models can be, Dirty SHA and I, we did a little uh, comparison study from uh, taking stellar tracks from five different stellar evolution cores. So we uh, took stellar tracks from BPAS, uh, boost tracks from the Bond code. Uh, we took models from the Geneva code. Uh, we took missed tracks from MISA code and uh, PASIC tracks. And we took tracks of massive stars, so between nine and 200 solar masses for uh, non-rotating stellar models at solar metallicity. So Z is equal to 0.014 except for boost tracks where these models weren't available. So we took slowly rotating models at near solar metallicity. <clears throat> and this is what we found when we tried to just compare different stellar tracks, that there are huge differences between different sets of stellar models. To understand and look at this picture closely, let's take um, two uh, of the stars here. So let's look at our 2425 solar mass star. And what I'm showing here is an HR diagram. So on the x-axis, we have the effective temperature and in Kelvin, and on the y-axis, we have log of um, luminosity. And these different curves here, they represent the evolutionary history of a 24 or 25 solar mass star as predicted by these different stellar evolution codes. This portion here, up to this little hook, is the part where star is burning hydrogen and its core. So this is the main sequence bit. And the remainder of track is uh, the part where uh, the star is burning helium in its core. 
and have only plotted um, uh, this evolutionary history until the end of core helium burning. So you can see that for a 24, 25 solar mass star, at least on main sequence, these tracks agree very well. And even beyond main sequence, when star is burning helium in the core, these tracks vary a little bit, but not so much. These differences are due to the difference in different physical uh, inputs that were used in um, calculating these um, tracks, but otherwise they're pretty same because a 24, 25 solar mass star at this metallicity doesn't experience the effects of density inversions or Eddington luminosity. So this one agrees, these tracks agree well. But if we jump to 100 solar masses and take tracks, for example, at 120 or 125 solar masses, now you can see that all these tracks differ a lot, not even in their beginning position, but also where they end for helium burning. And you can see that they don't even agree on like this uh, main sequence part even. And these huge differences in stellar tracks can have huge implications. And the one I am currently looking at is again, the effect on gravitational wave progenitor properties. So um, to, to calculate it, to see this effect, um, I've calculated uh, the mass rem uh, of stellar remnants as predicted by these different stellar models. So what I have on the x-axis is the zero-ish main sequence mass of the star or the initial mass of the star. And on the y-axis, I have the remnant mass of the star as calculated from the Bijinsky et al. 2008 prescription using the final core mass and total mass of the star. And these different uh, colored lines represent uh, the remnant masses as uh, predicted by different stellar models. You can see that uh, for a 25 solar mass star, there is not much difference because um, as I said, like these uh, stars do not get affected uh, by Eddington luminosity. But as you go higher up in masses, the differences in stellar uh, determinant mass prediction or in the prediction of black hole masses can be as high as 20 solar masses. Now this has huge implications for not just gravitational wave astronomy, but even for other fields in astronomy. And there is no way of knowing which one of these tracks is correct or which one of them is wrong. They can equally be both right or wrong. So um, how to solve this? Well, the good news is uh, through observation, we have our observing capabilities have improved a lot in the past uh, 10, 20 years. We have had dedicated uh, telescopic surveys for massive stars. We have constraints from astro seismology. We now have a very um, well-developed multi-messenger astronomy, and of course, which includes uh, gravitational wave detections. But in order to make use of all these uh, observations, we need to evolve not just one or two, but a population of massive stars. And that's why population, that's where population synthesis comes in picture. It simply means to evolve a large number of a population of stars and also take into account the different interactions between them. So it can take into account the dynamical interactions between stars if they are in a star cluster or interaction due to a binary companion. Using population synthesis curves, we can model systems like star clusters, but we can also more explore the parameter space of different kind of stars like binary stars to find systems of interest. So in our case, we'll be evolving um, not many binary stars to find which one of them will merge and give rise to gravitational waves that LIGO and Virgo can predict. Detect, sorry. So um, these population synthesis codes are very useful. They uh, take input from stellar evolution codes. So they take into account the evolution of a star and then they add into all different interactions and everything and help create a model then we can then which we can then compare with observations. In this process, they not only help us compare our models with observation, but they also provide feedback to stellar evolution code but through new stellar data and input physics. So they provide feedback on our stellar evolution models. But in order to do so, population synthesis codes have certain requirements because these codes are by themselves computationally very expensive and time consuming. The requirements from the underlying stellar evolution code is it should be computationally inexpensive, it should be fast, it should be robust, so it shouldn't break down, it should be adaptable, so it should be able to make use of different set of stellar models so we can test them. And of course, if we can provide information about structure and chemical composition of the star. Now let's see where our 1D stellar evolution codes fit in this picture. Well, they are very adaptable to changes. 
and they have wealth of information both about stellar structure and evolution of star. However, they are computationally expensive and time consuming. It can take hours to evolve just a single star to 1D stellar evolution course, especially massive stars. And also as we have seen that they can break down at times, so they are not robust. And therefore we cannot directly use them in population synthesis course. So uh, people have tried to come up with some shortcut methods and one such method is fitting formulae to stellar evolution tracks. So in this method, what we do, we just compute a few stellar tracks through 1D stellar evolution code. And then we define fitting formulae to different properties such as the luminosity and radius of stars. And then every time we have to evolve a star or compute stellar uh, properties in a population synthesis code, we just make use of these formulae. Now, um, a good example of a code that makes use of such a method is the SSC fitting formulae. Um, it was uh, developed by Harley et al. in year 2000, and it's based on the polynomial fits to the stellar tracks um, computed by Paul et al. in 1998. Now, with these fitting formulae, the code becomes computationally inexpensive. It's really fast. Fitting formulas can evolve, uh, evolve uh, hundreds of stars in less than a minute and it's, it's a very robust method. Now, the problem, the downside is that these fitting formulae are not adaptable to changes. So every time you have to uh, evolve, um, uh, have a different set of stellar models, you will have to calculate this formulae again. And these formulas by themselves are very difficult to calculate. Also, you can uh, define these formulae for only so many properties of stars. So uh, they will provide very limited information about stellar evolution. And therefore, they also don't fit uh, the bill um, of what we want to do. And therefore, I have developed a new method, method of interpolation for single star evolution. As the name suggests, uh, uh, it uses interpolation to calculate evolutionary properties of star at any instant. So again, you have stellar evolution tracks, some detailed codes, and every time when you, uh, for only certain number of stars, and then every time you need to compute properties uh, for a population of stars, you just interpolate between these tracks. Now, interpolation by itself is uh, not a new method. It's very old, even older than the method of fitting formulae. But uh, because of the computation requirement, it hasn't been uh, used with population synthesis codes in the past. So the thesis is, um, uh, has been specially developed to ma make use of interpolation with fitting formulae and um, it can compute stellar parameters uh, from starting from zero each main sequence of the star to the end of its respective remnant phase. And it can also do it quickly, it can again evolve um, hundreds of stars in less than a minute. Uh, it has been specially developed as an as alternative to SSC fitting formulae in different population synthesis code. And the best part is it, uh, it has similar computational requirement as SSC but it can make use of different sets of stellar models so we can test our stellar models in uh, the population synthesis codes. To demonstrate this, we test MITIs with uh, stellar tracks from MISA and Bond code. So what I have on the left side here, in the solid lines, we have detailed tracks from MISA. So these are uh, the tracks computed from the detail, uh, MISA stellar evolution code. And in the solid lines here, uh, we have the stellar tracks from the Bond code. And in the dash line, both places, we have the tracks that were interpolated to MITIs. So we uh, computed uh, certain tracks from both these code and we asked MITIs to uh, generate um, evolutionary tracks for stars uniformly distributed in the initial mass range of nine to 100 solar masses and for a metallicity value of 0.001. Just to keep um, a small highlight that this metallicity value is one tenth of what I was showing earlier. So it's slightly lower um, compared to other plots. And when we do that, and we, again, if we try to make a prediction for gravitational wave uh, progenitor properties, um, so we have this plot. Um, on the x-axis, we have the initial mass of the star. And on the y-axis, we have the remnant mass of the star calculated with the Bichinsky et al. prescription. In the um, blue circles here, we have the remnant masses as predicted by METIs using MISA models. In the red uh, stars here, we have um, the remnant masses calculated by METIs using bond models. And for comparison, in the yellow plus here, we have the remnant masses as predicted by SSE. 
Just a quick reminder, SSE is our old method of fitting formula. Now you can see that for stars up to 18 solar masses or so, there's hardly any difference in the remnant mass predicted by these different codes. And they agree very well. But again, as you start going higher up in masses, about 40 solar mass or so, you again see a difference of almost 20 solar mass in the, uh, diff uh, in the prediction of remnant masses between different stellar evolution codes. So as I said, this has huge implication, not just for gravitational wave astronomy, but also for other um, fields in astrophysics. Now, so far, I have only been talking about massive stars as a single star, uh, from a single star point of view. But these stars, um, as we now know, occur in binaries or even in stellar multiples. So what about binarity? Well, to take that into account, I'm currently working on implementing METIS as an alternative to SSC in the binary stellar evolution code BSC. And with this, we'll be able to account for the different processes that include mass transfer due to binary interaction, and we'll be able to test different sets of stellar models and their implication on binary evolution. But this is a work in progress, so I can't directly um, show any plots uh, from this. However, I can just to give, an, give you an idea of how imp the impact of all these different models can have on binary evolution, I can show you another plot. So um, the plot about the radial expansion of the stars. So this is a similar plot. On the x-axis, we have the initial mass of the star. But this time on the y-axis, I have the maximum radii achieved by this star, achieved by a star during its lifetime, as predicted by these different stellar models. And you can see that for lower mass stars, at least the predictions between uh, METIS with MESA and METIS with BC, they agree very well. But for higher uh, masses, there can be an order of magnitude difference between um, the prediction of radi uh, maximum radii between these different stellar models. And also, SSC, as you can see, kind of over predicts um, the stellar radii uh, again by a lot. And this has huge implication because radial expansion can trigger the episodes of mass transfer in interacting binaries. So there's a lot of interesting science that is yet to come, but um, uh, we are limited on time and also work. So going back to my uh, summary slide and um, uh, uh, going back to the question, can uncertainties in the evolution of massive stars explain properties of gravitational wave progenitors? Well, the answer is yes, they do. In fact, we have seen that how modeling uncertainties for lives of these massive stars can affect their evolutionary outcome. And to, in order to uh, validate this, to test which of them is correct, we need to compare our stellar models with observation. And the good part is we now have METIs using which we can test our stellar models with population synthesis code and rule out the correct and incorrect uh, incorrect properties for massive stars. With that, I would um, miss my talk and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pujan. I'm sure everybody is clapping in front of the screen right now, so we can't hear them. I'm sure it's happening. Um, so let's see um, if there are any questions coming. Of course, uh, there is a bit of a delay of the stream on YouTube. So let's give them a few seconds to get to the end of your talk. Um, but meanwhile, then I will ask a question. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nicola, there are two questions on the on the. Oh, I can see the. Uh, sorry, oh, the the, 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 yeah, sorry oh. that I jumped in there just because I saw that uh, I, I, uh, uh, I Sang, the... uh, sorry, there were two raised hands in the in the Zoom chat, actually. Oh, this is a problem because I can't see them. Uh, don't worry, don't worry, I, I just know, uh, sorry if I jumped in, this is Jack no, speaking. I, it, it's uh, Il Sang first and then I also raised uh, my hand, actually, if I can make a question. Thanks. Uh, so sure, it's, then, it's, uh, is it Il Young? Zang? Please. Oh, may I speak? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pujam, the very nice presentation. So I would like to ask some naive question regarding the few plots that you show in the very last of your presentation of a the predicted distribution of the mass and the remnant mass versus a, the progenitor mass. 
and comparing different stellar popul the evolutionary models, I always found that the evolutionary model with a the MISA shows a the qualitatively different behavior at around a, the 40 solar mass, you know, range, the after 40 solar mass, the compared to the other, you know, the methods like BEC. So is there any physical reason why these two models produce, produce a qualitatively different result at around you know, 40 solar mass and beyond? Yes, um, that's a very good question. And slightly tricky to answer uh, in the short time frame, but I'll try. So what happens that with both, um, maybe uh, if I go to this slide, this will help me explain it a little better. So you can see that uh, up until 40 solar masses or so, both these uh, tracks are evolving in similar manner. So um, uh, these, tra these stars are becoming red supergiants and ending their uh, uh, evolution here. Um, however, as you start going up uh, above 40 solar masses for 50 solar uh, mass or something, you get these tracks are slightly different. Now hold on there for a moment and let's look at tracks which are even more massive for example, the 70 solar mass star here, this track, it, before it can finish burning helium in its core, it evolves off to become a naked helium star. It loses all of its envelope. Now, um, what happens in between the, this, that these stars, they are struggling um, to evolve, like become a red supergiant. So the, the, the shell burning, the hydrogen shell burning and the core helium burning is pushing uh, them towards this uh, uh, lower temperature regime, but they're also losing mass because uh, of adding the luminosity and the fix. And that's why that thing is pushes them to hotter temperatures. So while these stars can happily evolve to become red supergiants, and these stars can happily evolve to become naked helium stars, these stars are kind of stuck in, in between. And if you look at the Kippenham plots, when we look at uh, the profiles, we find there's a very thin um, uh, hydrogen shell, which still survives. It's like some four or five uh, solar masses. So it's there, it's non-existent, but it's kind of uh, uh, making these stars become like a little bit oscillate in the middle. Now, when I'm trying to interpolate this with Matisse, you see that uh, for up to 40 solar mass, you get this linear behavior. So uh, you get this uniform increase, but after that, now the tracks, okay, we don't have, uh, there are more tracks in between, but still we are interpolating between them. So in this regime where you are getting a red supergiant versus a naked helium star, the code is trying to uh, balance other properties and that's why it's slightly different here. Does that answer your uh, question? Yeah, thank you partly. I was trying to figure out what's the physics behind it, but yeah, thank yeah, you. It's, it's mostly just like all the factors, like what was the input used and everything. And it's not just with MISA, like, this particular set of tracks were computed using one set of parameters, but I'm also working just with MISA to just test this different hypothesis that within one code to see how just, if I keep everything else same, but just change these different assumptions for treating with Eddington luminosity, what impact it will make. And trust me, it makes a lot of impact. So these models can vary a lot, even within the same code. Thank you. Okay. Uh we have another question from yes. Giacomo and about yes. a minute, so. Yes, yeah, sorry, just very quickly. I thank you very much from my side as well. Very, very, very clear, uh, nice presentation. Congratulations. And my question is, so you explained very well at the very beginning uh, how critical is the, the, the choice and the understanding of the, so in the Eddington limb, it's basically the standard of the opacity, right? So I, and I was wondering, but do, would you, because then you show basically, if my again is a very naive point of view, my because I'm not an expert, but I, I seem to understand that then there are certain workarounds that one can play, given the fact that there are so much uncertainty in the in in the opacity. But but do you think we are really solving the problem of opacity? So are we? Do we know how to treat opacity properly? So would you? How can we face this issue uh, somehow? Because because the ingredients that you put in in the code is so the chemistry that you put into the code is critical, right? Also to, to for the for, to predict basically the outcome of the evolution of the star. 
That's, that's again is a really good question. And honestly, this is like a question that I have, I'm trying to like answer for myself because I'm mostly, my job is to just take stellar models and put them in population synthesis code. But as I started working with this, I realized that, okay, there are all these different um, assumptions that stellar, and it, it was first started with MISA, but then I realized that other codes also have similar, they also use, make use of these methods. Well, one solution for this is changing the mixing length theory. So not using mixing length theory, using some alternative theory of conviction. There are alternative theories, but um, again, like, uh, it's the, like the ease of MLT and the, the fact that it's successful for mostly other things, it still makes like stellar evolution codes use it. And yeah, the, the uncertainty is that's why like it's important to test these models because we can also um, like make use of different uh, 3D codes and hydrodynamic codes. So th there, have been, there have been studies where people try to study uh, these conviction uh, and how the density inversions are behaving in 3D. Its behavior is slightly different and it kind of agrees with the uh, mass loss property or the clumping property. So in a way, if you're artificially enhancing mass loss um, in your stellar models, it could be right. But again, that's like, you, uh, in order to justify it, like um, make sure that it's correct, we need to compare it with observation. And again, there are, it's, it's a good thing that because, it's, uh, like, because of gravitational waves, people have once again become very interested in massive stars. Uh, so there are now comparative studies. There's a very recent paper um, by Claude Schaffner. I think it was released March 2021. So a couple of last month or something. And there they actually do such a comparative study. They compare the effect of these density inversions and mass loss with, I think, uh, 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 massive stars from LMC. So just making these comparisons between uh, uh, three, 1D codes and 3D codes, so results between them and between them and observation is I think the way to go. But again, we for that we need population and that's why we need MIDIs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, congratulations. Um, yes, um, let's, well, I'd, I'd like to thank Pujan again for a great and certainly very clear talk. Thank you very much. And as Jack already said, congratulations again. Uh, I'll leave now the word to Samuel, who will introduce our next speaker for today. Thank you, Nicola. For our second talk this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Carwin. Chris obtained his PhD from the University of California, Irvine, and is currently working as a postdoctoral fellow at Clemson University in South Carolina. His research focuses on high energy astrophysics using the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So Chris, um, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Samuel. Let me just share my screen. You can see my screen okay? Yep, you can see it. Okay, can... Um, great, thanks. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so I'll be talking about gamma rays from fast black hole winds. And uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, the authors listed here. Uh, and it's also a Fermilab collaboration paper, uh, and the paper is under review with science advances. Um, so I'll start by describing the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is the telescope I work with, uh, then describe these black hole winds, uh, also referred to as ultrafast outflows or UFOs. Uh, then I'll discuss the stack analysis that we use and uh, present the results as well as uh, the physical implications. Uh, so I work with data collected by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, uh, shown here. Uh, so on the left here, you see the telescope being launched uh, from Cape Canaveral with NASA's Delta-1 rocket. Uh, and then to the right is an artist's uh, rendition of the telescope, which is in low Earth orbit. Um, there are two instruments on board. There's the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor, um, but the main instrument is the Large Area Telescope, which you see on top here. Uh, so this is the instrument that I work with. Um, and then in the lower left is a schematic of the telescope. Um, and essentially how it works is that a gamma ray photon comes in, it's converted into an electron uh, positron pair in the tracker modules. And then that energy is deposited into the calorimeter. Um, and from these measurements, you can then reconstruct the direction in the sky from which the photon originated, um, as well as the incident energy. And uh, Fermi is sensitive to energies from roughly uh, 20 MeV to 300 GeV. 
Uh, and so what it produces is an all sky gamma ray counts map uh, shown here. And so how this works is uh, that towards the center of the map, this is looking towards the center uh, of the Milky Way. Um, and then you can imagine rotating 360 degrees and taking that image and uh, projecting it onto two dimensions. Uh, and that's what's shown here. Um, and so the bright emission along the center there, that's the disk of the Milky Way. Uh, but there's also a diffuse emission over the entire sky, uh, which you should see in blue. And then you can also uh, identify many uh, different point sources. Um, so the UFOs that I'm discussing today, this is a, this is a class of gamma ray point sources. Uh, so first, just a bit uh, about the uh, gamma ray sources in general. Uh, so the current catalog uh, known as the 4FTL uh, contains over uh, 5,000 sources. And so this uh, chart here kind of gives you the breakdown of the different source classes. Um, and so when you look in the extragalactic sky, most of the sources are blazars. And that's shown with this uh, large blue slice here. Um, there are also uh, many un unassociated sources uh, that's shown with the pale blue. Um, but when you look in the disk of the Milky Way, uh, most of the sources that you see are pulsars uh, shown with the orange slice. Um, and then there are a number of other uh, source classes as well. Uh, but in total, there are only about 14 uh, known source classes, uh, which really isn't that many. Um, generally, we expect that there should be uh, many more, uh, only that their flux must just be uh, too low uh, to be detected by um, the LAT. Uh, and so one of the um, main uh, programs that we have is searching for these uh, other uh, gamma ray source populations. And of course, today I'll be discussing uh, one of these, which would be the uh, UFOs. Um, so to put this into a bit of context, uh, so UFOs are associated with active, active galactic nuclei uh, or AGN. And uh, AGN are known to launch and power outflows. Um, probably the best example of this uh, are AGN jets, uh, which are very well studied in gamma rays and x-rays and radio. Um, so this is an example of a collimated outflow. Um, but there are also non-collimated outflows known as winds. Uh, they're much more difficult to detect, but they really are just as important. So we've been really interested in uh, these uh, AGN winds. Um, and so this schematic here uh, shows you the main different types of winds that you find at different characteristic radio scales uh, from uh, the black hole. And so starting at the left here, you have the UFOs uh, and then broad absorption lines, warm absorbers, narrow absorption lines, and then galactic scale outflows, including uh, molecular neutral and ionized gas phases, uh, and possibly even uh, large scale uh, bubbles, uh, such as the uh, Fermi in the Erosita bubbles that we observed in the Milky Way. Uh, so today I'll be just uh, focusing on the UFOs, but towards the end I'll also discuss uh, the bubbles a bit as well. Um, and of all these different types of outflows, the, the UFOs are the most energetic. Um, and as you can see, that they're launched from within subparsic scales from the black hole. Um, generally, they're found in both radio loud and radio quiet AGN. And they're primarily identified uh, from blue shifted iron uh, K shell absorption lines in X ray spectra around 7 keV. Um, so, the main physical picture that you have is that surrounding the black hole is a highly ionized gas with very large column densities. Uh, the gas is moving outward at about 10% um, the speed of light. And then X rays are emitted from the corona and they move through the gas, uh, exciting different electronic states. Um, and this shows up as absorption uh, in the X-ray spectrum. Um, and remember, all of this is happening on subparsic scales from the black hole. Uh, so an example of this is shown to the left here. Uh, this is for the source PG-1211-143. Uh, this is from Tom Bessie in all 2010, who pioneered a lot of this UFO work. Um, and here then is the same source, uh, but taken with the Chandra uh, spectrometer. And you can nicely see all these different abs absorption features. And by fitting this spectra, you can then obtain the main uh, UFO physical parameters uh, summarized here on slide nine. Um, and mainly to point out, you see that the kinetic power uh, ranges from around 10 to the 42 to 10 to the 45 ergs per second. 
Uh, so these are very energetic processes. And because of this, we expect that they may give us gamma rays. Um, specifically, the idea is that the outflowing gas will interact with the interstellar medium, and this will generate shock waves, which then uh, accelerate cosmic rays via diffusive shock acceleration, uh, very similar to what happens with supernova remnants. Um, and then from there, you get the gamma rays just from uh, standard processes. Uh, it can be hadronic, where you have cosmic ray protons interacting with protons of the gas, uh, this then produces pi zero mesons, which decay to gamma ray photons, uh, or it can be leptonic with cosmic ray electrons uh, emitting gamma rays through either Bremsstrahlung or inverse Compton radiation. Um, but for the UFOs, it's thought that the uh, hadronic scenario will dominate the emission. Um, so these are the gamma rays uh, that we're interested in detecting with the LAT. Um, there are a number of motivations for this. As I mentioned, just uh, the, the potential to discover a new gamma ray source class. Um, but also UFOs uh, are thought to likely play a significant role in AGN feedback and specifically in regulating the coevolution uh, of a galaxy and its central supermassive black hole. Uh, so just to remind, uh, there's, a, there's a very well-known scaling relationship between uh, the mass of a black hole and the velocity dispersion of the stars in the galactic bulge, uh, although it's uh, not clear as to why this relationship should be because the gravitational influence of the black hole does not extend that far. Um, and so one uh, leading idea is that um, it may be the winds associated with these UFOs that are responsible for uh, this coevolution. Uh, and correspondingly, um, these UFOs may also play a role in the uh, cold outflows that are observed on galactic scales in, in many galaxies. Um, lastly, if these UFOs are gamma ray emitters, then they may also contribute to the extragalactic gamma ray background, uh, as well as the ice cube neutrino flux. Uh, so this schematic here uh, describes the outflow mechanics in just a bit more detail. Um, and so starting at the AGN here, at the, uh, this would be the central engine, uh, you have the, the black hole wind, and then this interacts with the ISM generating the wind shock, uh, also known as the reverse shock. Um, and then the shock wind acts like a piston, and this uh, sweeps up the uh, host ambient gas at this contact discontinuity, uh, which is moving ahead of it. And then the swept up gas drives this outward forward shock into the surrounding uh, ambient gas. Um, now, the nature of the outflow really depends on the cooling that takes place at the wind shock. Uh, so if the cooling is very efficient, then the shocked wind quickly radiates away most of its energy, uh, in which case it transfers only its momentum to the ISM. Um, and this is known as a momentum-driven outflow. Uh, and these, type of, these types of outflows typically stay pretty close to the AGN. Um, on the other hand, if the cooling time is uh, long compared to the outflow time, then the uh, shock propagates throughout the galaxy, uh, transferring most of its kinetic energy. Uh, and this is known as an energy-driven outflow. Uh, and these are the types of outflows that are uh, thought to uh, contribute to AGN feedback and also um, to give you gamma rays. Um, but in the local universe, uh, the gamma luminosity from these sources is predicted to be around 10 to the 39 to 10 to the 40 ergs per second. And so this puts them below uh, the lat sensitivity, and that's why uh, we haven't detected these sources yet. And so what we do is uh, to use a stacking uh, technique to uh, look at a population of uh, UFO sources. And so important for this is our sample selection. And so what we do is we, we choose uh, all the radio quiet sources. Uh, so that there's no um, confusion with any uh, gamma rays coming from the jet. Uh, we also select the sources that are uh, nearby because of the low luminosity. Uh, so, we, so sources that are less have redshift less than 0 0.1. And then uh, the gamma ray luminosity is also uh, predicted to scale with uh, the velocity. And so we choose the uh, most energetic sources uh, having a velocity greater than uh, 0 0.1 C. Um, so the 11 uh, UFOs that satisfy this criterion are shown here on slide 12, and then their uh, physical properties are uh, summarized to the right here. Um, and as I mentioned, we use a stacking uh, technique with this sample. 
the technique that we use uh, now is pretty well established and has been uh, well validated. Uh, it's been used in a number of other population studies, including uh, the EBL, extreme blazars, and uh, star forming galaxies. And uh, the main assumption that we make with this method is that the population can be described by average physical quantities, such as the average flux and spectral index. Um, there are then really two main steps to the method here. Uh, so first, uh, for each source, we define a 10 degree by 10 degree region of interest, uh, and we optimize the model parameters using a bin likelihood analysis. Um, and then in the second step, uh, for each source, we construct uh, two-dimensional uh, TS profiles uh, by iterating through values of uh, flux and index. Um, and then because the TS is an additive quantity, we form the combined likelihood uh, by summing all of the individual profiles, um, as I'll show here in a second. Um, and this then gives the statistical significance of the combined signal. Um, so we employ this uh, stacking method to our sample and the results are shown here on slide 14. Um, so to the left there, this is the uh, stack profile for the benchmark sample. On the y-axis, you see that's the photon index and on the x-axis, that's the gamma ray flux uh, integrated between uh, one and 800 GeV. And um, the color scale that corresponds to the TS. And as you can see, uh, we do detect a signal with a uh, corresponding to a 5.1 sigma detection. Um, and this is for um, a spectral index of around 2.1 and a photon flux of around 2.5 times 10 to negative 11. Um, now we've performed a number of uh, tests to kind of uh, validate this result. Uh, one such test is to look at a control sample uh, where this control sample has similar physical characteristics as the UFO sample, uh, but for which no UFO has been found. Um, and so the results for that are shown to the right here. And as you can see, uh, in this case, there is no signal with the max TS being around one. Um, we've also uh, find that just based on the gamma ray mission, it's, uh, the signal's really just uh, too bright to be coming uh, from star formation. Uh, and it's likely, and it's uh, also unlikely uh, that it could be uh, generated from any potential uh, weak jets that may be in these sources. Um, another prediction for these UFOs is that the gamma ray luminosity uh, should scale with the bolometric luminosity. Uh, and so to test this, we perform the stacking in bins of bolometric luminosity, uh, as well as efficiency, uh, where the efficiency is defined as the ratio of uh, L gamma over L bull. Um, and as you see, indeed, we do uh, see uh, a scaling relation and we measure the efficiency to be uh, around 3.2 times 10 to the negative four. Um, so we model this uh, signal uh, based on this hadronic emission model resulting from diffusive shock acceleration. Um, and this is summarized nicely in these two plots. Uh, so to the left here, uh, the black data points, that's our observed SCD. And then the solid curves there, that's the predicted hadronic emission at different time steps. And so this is time of the outflow, um, which corresponds to a radius of the forward shock as it propagates throughout the galaxy. Um, and here we've just assumed a, a simplified one dimensional spherical model. Um, and then below that is the uh, predicted leptonic emission, which we find to be subdominant. And then to the left is the corresponding uh, synchrotron radio emission. Um, and then the plot on the right shows you the time evolution of the gamma ray luminosity, uh, shown with red here. On the, and again, on the bottom x axis, that's time, which corresponds to uh, the radius of uh, the forward shock on the top x axis. And uh, from this model, we can infer a number of things. Uh, so one, we can say that the forward shock has traveled roughly 20 to 300 parsec away from the black hole. Um, and that's just based on the peak in the luminosity here. Um, so this is a really interesting result because remember that these winds are thought to be launched from subparsec scales from the black hole. Uh, so this would indicate that this forward shock is indeed um, propagating well into the galaxy. 
Um, we also uh, find that the maximum proton energy is around 10 to the 17 electron volts. And so this makes AGN winds a potential source uh, of the cosmic rays beyond the knee of the spectrum and also possible contributors to the EGB and the ice neutrino flux, also considering uh, the spectral features that we, that we measure. Um, lastly, um, to discuss these bubbles a bit, uh, this map here uh, shows the recently discovered E. Rosita bubbles uh, from Predilnol 2020, uh, shown in green. And they've also overlaid uh, the Fermi bubbles, which are bubble-like features that you see in gamma rays. Uh, and that's shown in red here. Um, now, this, the nature of these bubbles is still an open question. It's still a matter of debate. Uh, but here I'm just outlining our, the simplest scenario as described in this uh, detection paper, which essentially has a one-to-one -one correspondence with this uh, schematic that I went through earlier. Uh, so just to highlight some of the main features in, in this map here. Uh, so first, the central engine, that would be the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, uh, Sagittarius A star. Uh, so today, Sagittarius A star is uh, not active, uh, but uh, it may have been active as recently as 300 uh, years ago. And then the, fir uh, the red, the Fermi bubbles, that would be uh, the shocked wind, uh, which has um, uh, measured gamma ray luminosity of around 10 to the 37.6 hertz per second. Um, now this distinct border here, that would be the contact discontinuity, and then the uh, X-ray radiation, that would be uh, the shocked gas, which has a measured thermal energy of around 1.3 uh, times 10 to the 56 ergs, um, and a predicted expansion time of around 20 million years. And then finally, this second distinct boundary would be uh, the forward shock as this bubble propagates into the uh, halo gas of the Milky Way. And so what we can do as just a kind of a back of the envelope calculation is to scale our model to the Milky Way uh, just based on the volumetric luminosity, uh, which we've done here. And so and now this plot on the right here, so now the, the dashed cyan line, this shows you the, um, the thermal energy in the gas. And if we trace this to at 10 to the 56 ergs uh, corresponding to the E Rosita bubbles, uh, you see our model predicts uh, inflation time of around 10 million years and the gamma ray uh, luminosity of around uh, 1 times 10 to the 37 ergs, and, and this is just at 1 GeV. Um, now, our model is not at all tuned to the Milky Way other than just doing this uh, simple scaling, um, but nevertheless, we are able to make uh, this prediction on the, on the um, energetics and the inflation time that is in uh, fairly good agreement with uh, the observations. And so um, this then uh, kind of supports the idea that the Fermi and E. Rosita bubbles uh, may be the remnant of past uh, UFO-like activity from uh, Sagittarius A star. Um, so in the paper, we just comment on this, I think one or two lines, uh, but I think it's a really interesting uh, connection. So that takes me to my summary slide. Uh, we do detect this uh, UFO population uh, with a significance of 5.1 sigma uh, for this best fit spectral index of around 2.1 and a, a photon flux of around 2.5 times 10 to negative 11. And we find that the gamma ray emission uh, scales with the volumetric luminosity uh, and we measure the efficiency to be um, 3.2 times 10 to negative four. And then I've discussed uh, some of the um, physical implications uh, for that detection. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Chris, for a very nice uh, and informative talk. Uh, so yeah, we've got some time for questions now. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, you can type them in the chat and uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that. But from the uh, Zoom audience, we have a raised hand from Ilsang again. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk, Christopher. Uh, it's quite interesting that you show that shock travels actually 20 to 30, 300 parsecs from the supermass black hole. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you assume some sort of a, the, the particular opening angle for those winds to actually predict a, the, jet, the sh shock propagations or is in general, the, regardless of the, how wide or you know, narrow the opening angle it is, is always the case, the shock travels up to that length scale? 
Yeah, generally the UFOs uh, are found to have a large uh, opening angle, uh, but for our modeling, um, we've done something very simple where we just assume this kind of spherical one dimensional model. Um, so this has not yet been incorporated, but this is something that, that we're looking into doing for a follow up um, um, where we um, use a two dimensional model. So definitely this is something, uh, it, is, it is something important that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, thank you. So are there any more hands on the Zoom thing? Nothing yet on YouTube, but there might be a slight delay. Uh, Giacomo. Yeah, sorry, Chris, thank you very much. I have just a, a curiosity. Sorry, I'm really not an uh, expert in the field, but I found your last result very interesting. And I was wondering, uh, the last uh, point there, I was wondering, is there any, um, I would say follow up observations in other wavelengths basically can uh, help you to disentangle this possibility of 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 UFO like activity uh, in the local bubble. Well, it's it's quite interesting actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think something interesting that we're also looking into. One would be looking at um, at the neutrinos, so the neutrino flux, uh, seeing if there's any kind of association there with UFOs. Uh, and also to look uh, closer at just very high energies. Um, because yeah, based our spectrum, the, the other going the other way down to say the MEV band, uh, it looks like um, at least from the modeling that we've done that the, the, the spectrum is falling off pretty quickly at lower energies. So um, the interesting places to look seem to be at higher energies with very high energy uh, gamma rays, uh, as well as the ice cube uh, neutrinos. Okay. Is it so just a, this is completely maybe sorry if it's so naive, but the alpha magnetic spectrometer does it uh, contribute somehow to this physics or, or not really? You know, the the, the instrument, the, 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 the experiment that is on the International Space Station, uh, wow. Space Station, yeah. does it is observing cosmic ray a very high energy? So I don't know, I was wondering whether this complements somehow. Uh, oh, I see. Um, no. In this case, of what, yeah, so they're measuring cosmic rays, but for for example, um, you know, you kind of lose the directionality of where mm -hmm. these cosmic rays are coming from. But um, so directly to the UFOs, no, it doesn't apply. I mean, it does apply like when you're subtracting the foreground model from say the Milky Way, it depends strongly on the local cosmic ray density. So that's actually going into the models, but as far as the UFOs go, not directly to the UFOs. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have any more questions from our panel here? Uh, if not, just a quick question I had. Um, the slide when you mentioned that there is some evidence that uh, Sagittarius A star was active uh, as recently as 300 years ago. Is that uh, evidence taken from these uh, um, Fermi bubbles that we see or is that um, where does that evidence come from? Yeah, uh, this is based on uh, X-ray observations. Um, on the top of my head, I'm forgetting the, it's a, it's a fairly old reference, but, um, but they're based on X-ray observations. Great, thanks. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So um, I'd like to thank our speakers again and pass back over to Giacomo. Yes, yes, thank you very much. So I also thank the speakers once again, and also would like to thank Samuel and Nicola for chairing the session. Thank you so much. And also for the participants for joining us and for uh, for making the, so for participating to our events. I, I would like to uh, remind you that uh, the next Tuesday, we won't have another Ipatia colloquium, but we will have uh, instead a duologue, a cosmic duologue, and the duologue will be on the use of metrics in science and in evaluation processes. So we will, we will learn about and listen to what is wrong and what is okay with this method. So please join us next Tuesday, same time. And then we will start again with the Ipatia in, uh, at the beginning of May. With this again, I would like to thank again, uh, Chris uh, Pogiab for the beautiful uh, presentation and for the nice work. Congratulations. Thanks, Samuel. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>